called Subchain <laughs> and co-founded uh, uh, Skew Science, which is a demand forecasting platform. Um, and he also teaches at universities in Paris, France, and Brussels, um, and, and continues to coach and train practitioners on these topics we're going to talk about today. So a wealth of knowledge there, and we will um, pick to him first. But before we get there, um, Barry Kukuk is our uh, is NetStock's chief technology officer uh, and founder of, of NetStock, which is a technology company that, that focuses on uh, exactly what we're talking about today. He's based out of Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, and uh, Nicolas being out of Brussels, by the way. Um, and and he, he's got a load of experience, 23 plus years of experience um, working with organizations of all sizes. Um, he, he's got a perspective here that he's going to bring to the table. Um, I think you guys are all going to really enjoy it. And, and he's responsible for all customer facing, facing technologies at NetStock. Um, and there's some of his information if you, if you want to connect and, and, and learn more. Um, and with that, Nicholas, I'm going to stop. Oh, no, I'm going to go over the agenda. Um, so we've got, a, like I said, we've got a packed uh, agenda for the day. Uh, we're going to talk through the five best practices for 2022, the importance of inventory management, prioritizing your products, We'll get into some classification around ABC, XYZ, um, reactive versus proactive approach. And then, then we're going to take a little bit of a step back and really talk about the supply chain shift and, and what's the, what is the modern way of looking at inventory within today's environment. Um, and then um, we will open up for Q&A at the end. So we're, we're looking at about 30 minutes of presentation time, about 15 minutes of, of Q&A, something like that. Um, is what we're going to shoot for. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to you, Nicolas. Um, oh, your great, time? thanks. Okay, great. So you already introduced the agenda. So my part would be really focused on these best practices for inventory uh, management. Um, to, to start with, I would just like to introduce the subject of, okay, we all have inventory, you all work for a different supply chain, but why do we have inventory and what are the costs of having this inventory? Maybe as I present this uh, uh, slide, Nadja, would you mind opening the, the part on Zoom to take the, the temperature of the room? Um, so for all the participants, we have some questions for you uh, that we will ask through Zoom so we can see um, where the, the crowd stands um, today. So let's start with the first question now, maybe. You should see that. Yeah, great. Uh, no, that's not the question. It's another question I had in mind. Uh, no, that doesn't seem to work. Yeah, I lost control of being able to do the... Uh, why okay, that's fine. I just, I just, um, ah, perfect. Here's the question. Okay, so just to start the, the, the conversation, I wanted to take the temperature of the room. So we have here a question just to, to ask you how it is going with inventory if you feel like you have too much inventory right now or you're facing um, shortages. So as you reply to this question, and um, you, you can see it on the poll right now, I will just uh, move on with the, the, the slide. So why do we have inventory as a supply chain? So what we want to have is just to have the right amount of inventory. If it happens that currently you have too little inventory and you face shortages, basically what happens is that your client is not satisfied and you put too much pressure on your production uh, capabilities, right? So you're gonna put a lot of pressure on your factories to produce more, to get more flexibility, to do extra hours. You might need to do some uh, fast shipping, expedition, and so on. So transaction costs are going to get higher and higher, and you're going to face shortages, OK? Now, on the other side, you want to say, OK, Nicola, having too little inventory sounds quite bad, so I'm going to order as much as I can, and I'm going to stockpile inventory. So what happens then is that you have the risk of having obsolescence. You have the risk of having dead stock, excess inventory. It's going to take space in your warehouse. You might even have to open a second warehouse to rent extra space. And it costs a lot of money, right? So not enough inventory, it's going to cost you money. Too much inventory, it's going to cost you money. What we need to have is just to have the right amount of inventory. Now, obviously, if you have the right amount of inventory, you're going to reach a certain uh, amount of service level. You're going to have a smooth ordering process, either internally with your own factories or toward your supplier. And you're going to be protected against any supply or demand 
uh, variation. That's just the right amount. Um, I think it's important to understand this slide and to understand that inventory, it's kind of a trade-off, right? Um, people that would always tell you, you need to have less inventory, less inventory, less inventory. It's just, it is just gonna put too much pressure on your supply chain. Always having less inventory might not be the best idea. You just need to have the right amount. So I don't know if we can see here the result of um, the poll. So we could see where you stand today. Uh, do we have the result? I don't see it. So maybe let's go to the next slide and we'll see later if we can go um, back to it. Okay, so now I set the scene and we understand that, okay, we need to have the right amount of inventory in our supply chain. Um, a subject that has been close to my heart for the last um, month, it's really that as human, the time we can dedicate to work is limited, right? You don't want to work 24 hours a day and then you cannot possibly review every single product you are responsible of, right? So somehow when you start your day, you should spend time on a few critical um, products, okay? And that's very important for me. And I think that when we design models, when we design dashboard interface and so on, we should make this model and dashboard to support us, the human, so we know what to work on um, next. Um, now, when we talk about this, a lot of people are gonna say, well, I need to do this ABC, XYZ uh, metric, so I know what's the most important thing I should focus on. And I'm gonna work first on this kind of uh, most important item. Now, again, Nadja, would you mind opening the, the poll on Zoom so we can discuss a bit um, ABC, XYZ with everyone to see where people stand in terms of ABC, XYZ. Do we have the burn? Yeah, we're having some technical difficulty there. So we might just have to ask the question and write it in chat. Oh, there we go. Yeah, great. So for those of you who use uh, ABC, XYZ, you see the question now. And I just would like to see with the crowd what kind of information you want to display on ABC, XYZ when you want to review your inventory um, product. If you don't use it, you can also click on the option. No, I'm, I'm simply not using um, this tool. Um, now, as you reply to this question, going back to my slide, when we set up such a classification, we basically want to look at two things which are the most important products from a supply chain. I'm not answering yet how we do that, but let's say that's something we want to, to know. And the second thing we want to look at is where am I likely to add value? In the sense that if you review your inventory policy or if you review your current orders, you, run to, you want to review first important products and you want to review first things where it's likely that you're gonna make it better. You, you, you are likely to add value, right? Now, I, I just um, hosted a, a webinar on ABC XYZ uh, a few weeks ago, and we discussed ABC XYZ for demand planning and uh, forecasting. And when we discussed this for forecasting, the conclusion of this webinar a few weeks ago was that it was important to focus on products where um, the forecast ability was low. So your forecast engine had a lot of difficulties in the past, and you should focus on the product and review this product first because it's likely you're going to add value to these products, okay? Now, this is something that works for demand planning, but for inventory management, it might not be the case. Okay, I got the result from the poll. Thank you so much for answering that. I see that we, we got a lot of answers, nearly 200. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. I see that a lot of you are saying, I'm, I'm putting their historical volumes and sales, some of you future forecasts. I love it. That, that makes a lot of sense to use future forecasts rather than historical volumes. So that's great. Let me try to, to push a bit more um, to, to, to refine ABC XYZ a bit. First, if you're really interested in the subject, I said a month ago, I, I hosted this webinar just on this subject. So you, you, you can always go back to this webinar to see how it can be used for demand forecasting. But here I'm really gonna focus on um, inventory management. Now, one of the best, uh, one of the, sorry, one of the very important question when you set up ABC XYZ, it's really like, what kind of information am I gonna use and display in this metrics? And you see now that I'm asking this question, maybe you're thinking I should show sales, I should show volumes, I should use the forecast and so on. So it's a lot of things you could possibly use, but it's not really clear which one is the best. Let me try to, to, to show you here some of the 
limit of A, B, C, X, Y, Z, especially in terms of inventory management. I think for demand planning, it's quite solid. For inventory management, we're, we're limited. So A, B, C, X, Y, Z, it's great because it's simple. And it's a simplification tool and, and we, we love it because it's simple, but it also contains some um, limitation. Um, first, you only have two dimension and our supply chain are not two dimensional object. We have a lot of things we need to pay attention to. So it's kind of difficult to boil it down to only two dimension. On top of that, ABC, XYZ, you just have two threshold per dimension. So somehow you're kind of limited, right? Um, what I'm really advising, especially for inventory management, is to start trying to review product based on something I would call smart multi criteria segmentation. Um, for example, something that's critical for inventory management is the supply uh, reliability. Products where you cannot trust your supplier or you never know if your supplier is going to be on time, you should review these first. You should call first these specific suppliers because you cannot really trust them. So your model doesn't know what to do, right? So in ABC XYZ, we would need to add a third dimension with like supply reliability, but it's kind of difficult to do, right? Um, in terms of inventory management, something else that's very important is this shelf life. I receive a lot of questions uh, for from SNOP leaders who, who, who deal with shelf life issues. It's really difficult to deal with that. Um, in the food industry, shelf life is putting a lot of pressure on people as well. So if you have products with shelf life, they should also get more attention. Um, and then remember when I started this question, I said, okay, but which product should we review first? I said, well, products that are important for you, for example, shelf life, uh, product with a supply, supply is limited, but also product where you're likely to add value, where you're likely to do better than the model. Um, so typically those would be products that are brand new. So forecast is quite bad, or you have some promotion. So you need to do maybe a specific deal with your supplier, or you need to do a specific production batch. And it's maybe product where you can collaborate with your supplier or your client. For example, it's a product, you know, your supplier is not reliable, but you also have the phone number of your supplier. So you could directly call the supplier to see what's going on. This is typically a product you should uh, spend your time on. Now, <clears throat> And this is one of the main points of this presentation. We should also focus our attention on product that we are expecting some shortages or we are afraid we're going to face some shortages or products for which we already have excess inventory. These are products where we have um, problems, right? And we want to focus on, the problem, on these problems. And as a human, we want to go there and fix these problems, okay? We're going to move now to um, this uh, subject. Um, so, Nadja, would you mind to show the um, next question on this uh, Zoom uh, poll? Great. So, one of the things I want to put forward is this in this webinar is the question of being reactive versus proactive in our supply chain. The question is quite simple. Do you act on shortages and in excess inventory once it's already there? So, you're missing some inventory and then you realize that you should call your supplier to expedite something. Or instead, are you proactive in the sense that today you have inventory in your warehouse, today you're good, but looking down the road, you see that in three weeks, you might face a shortage and you know that usually it takes one month for your supplier to deliver something. So you know that in three weeks, you're going to be in trouble and you can act right now. See, so these two things are really different, but I want to push you to go to this proactive zone where today you're fine, today the product is doing great, but the tool or your model would already know that in a few weeks, you're going to face an issue and you need to act now, even though right now everything is fine. Um, okay, let's just wait a few seconds to see the result of the poll and then we can move on to the solution, right? Okay, great. Perfect. So, um, <clears throat> In total, 70% um, says, I oh, know, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, 70% says, well, we, we react when it's uh, when when it's too late. Uh, no, I'm not reading that well. We react when it's too late, 30%, and we react before. We usually do it before it's too late. It's also 30%. So it's nearly 60% of you who says, well, I'm much more in the reactive zone where we tend to, we see there is an issue, and then we try to fix it rather than we fix it before it happens. Okay, let me show you a way uh, out of this. 
So the idea here with inventory management is that we want to act on problem before they happen. So in the end, nothing happens, right? We want to act before anything turns out badly, before we have excess inventory, before we have dead stock, and before we have shortages. Um, let me show you an example on how this could uh, work. So you have to imagine um, <clears throat> a, a dashboard, a data model, an inventory model, it doesn't matter really how you call it, that knows that you have different product, hammers, anvils, nails, screws. If you attend my webinar, you know, I'm always taking this uh, same example. I do not sell hammers. I have to say, uh, I don't have any promotion related to hammers, but I love the example. So here, the model will know how much inventory you have on hand in your warehouse right now, but also how much inventory you've ordered already to your suppliers. Like right? basically how much is already being ordered and on the way to your warehouse. If we would make a more complicated example, we could even add the date when you're going to get the next order. So this tool could give you like a status, you know, with a green light, uh, an orange light and a red line telling you, okay, is this good or is this bad? Now, what's interesting is, for example, um, anvils, you have five, but the tool knows that you have zero in transit, so you didn't order any. And based on the current forecast, the tool can predict that you will be out of stock by the time you receive your next order, even if you do it today. So this tool is telling you, well, you should pick up your phone and you should call your supplier to see what you can do about it. Because today it's fine, you have five, but usually it's gonna take, well, four, four months for your supplier to deliver. So you should really call the supplier right now. So you see how you can fix the problem before it happens. Same for the names. You have 1,500, but you have 3,000 coming to you in your next order. And the tool knows that 3,000 is too much. Based on your current forecast, current beat time, you don't need to order 3,000. So the tool is basically advising you to call your supplier to see if you can delay the order, cancel the order, or order something instead of these names, right? So what you see here is basically data and automation and models working hand in hand with human. So the tool is really advising you to act on a few problems where you, as the human, you can really add value and you're not there just you know, to update manually things um, in Excel. Now, two things are important here. Um, first is, as we automate this, as you update the, the, the forecast, because the demand planning team is, is, is creating a new forecast, or maybe the forecast is automated, maybe you review the lead time of your supplier. As soon as you do that, the model knows that the situation might change. Maybe as you update the forecast for, I don't know, names, well, the tool knows, but then you don't have too much names. You just write with the right level, so you don't need to call your suppliers anymore, right? And all of this is automated based on the lead times, based on the forecast, and every week, every day, the, the status get updated for everything. And you can even imagine this with this um, uh, information from your supplier that would really say when they expected um, to deliver the goods, so you really know where you stand today and if you need to order some more. Um, there is something else here that, that's really, really important. This will only work, it will only work if you have a very good inventory optimization system. If you do this, but you don't really have a clue on the lead time, the relationship between the lead time and how much you need to have, you have no clue on how much safety stock you need to have and so on, you might have these alerts, you might have this green light and, and red line, it's just that it will not be properly defined. Right. So before doing this, you need a lot of data, but you also need to have the right inventory optimization model. Otherwise, it will not work. So if you want to reach automation, if you want to reduce your workload, reduce excess and reduce shortages, you need to have the right data and you need to have the right inventory um, optimization uh, model. OK, um, let me move on to the next slide. We will discuss um, question, obviously, uh, after the, the presentation. OK. So as said, to do what I just highlighted, you're going to need a lot of data. So as soon as we have the input data, we can create an inventory model. And once we have an inventory model, we can do this kind of automated dashboard that will help you to know what you need to act on um, next. And this is where you get this automation and you reduce um, shortages in excess. Now, the issue with this kind of model, uh, not the issue, the, the challenge with this kind of model would be what kind of data and the amount of data you need to have. You need to have data about your supplier, master data, you need to have the forecast, historical demand, and so on, all the orders coming to you, and so on. So it's a lot of data that needs to be fed to this kind of automation system. And this is why you cannot really maintain such a thing um, in Excel because it's too much 
input that are required for this to run uh, properly. Let me give you an example, um, because actually I'm, I'm, I'm quite worried in supply chain in general on, on the amount of uh, time we spend at collecting the right lead time data from our uh, suppliers. Um, I recently hired uh, a first uh, employee, a, data, a, data, a supply chain data scientist to join me in my consultancy company as subchains. And he asked me well, what, what, what's difficult in, in this project. And I said, the most difficult find is not to create the model, it's to deal with the lead times from the suppliers because a lot of supply chain do not track exactly the lead times. They don't really maintain well the table about the lead times. And if the lead times in your data management system is wrong, you can have the best model in the world. It will simply never work because the lead time is wrong. And lead time change over time, right? Um, let me show you why lead times are so important. Um, so here on the right side of the screen, you have an inventory policy. It's, it's quite a simple one. Um, you know, you have this on hand inventory in blue here. And when it goes below this order point level, you make an order and you, you get a delivery after a certain lead time. Now, when you have an inventory optimization model, you want to define, okay, but what's this order point? Like, where should it be? Where should be this order level? Um, when you do this order level, most people think about safety stock. Maybe right now you're thinking, okay, it all depends on the safety stock and this kind of, uh, maybe you, you know the, the Z factor and the service level I want and so on. Yes, it's true. Safety stock is part of this order point. But on top of that, you also get a buffer against the lead time. And this is very important and people tend to forget about that. So when we have the order point and you can see that on the slide, I also need to be sure that I order in time. So I have enough inventory to cover the demand over the lead time. Now, obviously, if you type in your system, lead time is five days, but in real, it's 10 days, it will be out of stock by the time you receive your delivery. And then you get this kind of issue, right? So again, in short, if you want to automate inventory management, if you want to work on alert, um, if you want to avoid shortages, if you want to avoid excess inventory and dead stock, um, if you want to reduce your um, workload, you absolutely need to work first on your data and then on these inventory uh, models. Finally, to get this uh, dashboard. Um, okay, so finally, another thing that's very important for me in terms of inventory management, it's the collaboration you can do with demand planners. You know, as an inventory manager, you need to assess the risk, the supply reliability, um, the safety stock, you need to deal with all these supply orders coming in and your stock target, preparing for promotion, seasonality, and so on. But you need to work hand in hand with the demand planners that's gonna, who are going to prepare all the forecasts. So it's very important you spend time with them on the product that you think are the most critical. Again, most critical based on shelf life, um, supply reliability, and so on. Um, something that's very important with demand planning, and, and, and not a lot of people are pushing this forward, pushing this subject forward, and, and it's something that's really close to my heart in my books and so on, is the question of this, what I like to call the risk horizon. When you forecast a product, it's very important that you forecast it over an horizon that's long enough so you're sure that you can do your order in time. I've seen so many supply chains saying, we only forecast at M plus one or M plus two, or we only focus at M plus three, but actually they need to meet, they need to make orders to the supplier four or six months ahead. So this obviously does not work. As an inventory manager, it's very important that you show this lead time to the demand planner so they really know what's the horizon that you are interested in, okay? Um, now to conclude this presentation, I would say that going forward, what we need in terms of inventory um, management is we need to have the data, we create the model, and then we have the dashboard that help us really to work on this alert and become really proactive, avoiding these excess and obsolete um, inventory, okay? And this is really what I would call inventory planning excellence, okay? Um, as, demand, as, as inventory planner, sorry, I think it's very important that to understand that we should be here to run the business, call the suppliers, check on these orders, but we should not be here to just maintain massive files in Excel and do VLOOKUPs and pivot tables all day long. We should more spend time avoiding that any um, yeah, shortages or excess inventory happens in the future rather than spend our time maintaining files in Excel. I've seen so many people in supply chain, and I'm sure that most of you exactly see what I mean, spending the day on Excel, maintaining these massive files with 
10, 15, 20 sheets and spending the day just trying to maintain the Excel and, and basically praying that the Excel does not crash. Okay, We should not spend our time doing that. We should spend our time calling the supplier, making sure that we get these deliveries in time. Okay, So the idea is that we want to act more and we want to act before the problems arise. So, and by doing that, we let the model automate all the rest so we get less workload, okay? So, and, and I really love this sentence. It's not about working harder, it's about working smarter, okay? And let the tool automate and us, the, demon, the inventory planner, we should just focus on this um, alert. Um, to finish this presentation, um, Nadja, would you mind to open the last um, poll about the next steps? Yeah, great. I love to finish these uh, webinars with these kind of questions to kind of inspire you on what to do next, because we just discussed a lot of topics. I've been talking quite a lot and we have the opportunity to discuss questions. But I think it's also very important that you kind of set yourself, what's my next step? What's the next thing I should work on to just improve the situation here? Um, and I think it's also great that, that we, we can take some time to discuss that and um, uh, yeah, try to inspire each other on, on doing these uh, next steps. Let's maybe see the result in a few seconds and then I can leave the floor to uh, Barry. Great, and I see that 36% of you want to try this area-driven inventory management. That is absolutely great. I could convince a lot of you that you need to check data. I said, if you don't have the right data, it's going to be very difficult to automate anything or to do a model because, you know, garbage in, garbage out. This is like the, the, the right example. Um, and I'm also glad that for 17% of you, everything is working fine. And I think it's also great to say that at some point you think that, but I already do this, so that's great. I think it's great that for some of us, we already have most of these um, best practices. And I'm also glad to see that the rest of you are thinking, okay, I, I can move ahead. I just need to do that as my next steps. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. Barry, the, uh, floors is, the floor is yours. Hey, Josh, if you want to just start the second half of the presentation on screen. Um, hi, guys. Um, and uh, thank you, Nicholas. That was that was really amazing. Um, I thought what I what I would try um, today is, is um, like like Josh said, take a step back and understand uh, why do we need all of these systems? Um, and, you know, um, all of these systems that Nicholas just talked about is really, really important. Um, and the reason for that is because in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been this massive shift in supply chains um, that a lot of people, I think, haven't realized, especially kind of the mid and, and smaller size business um, haven't realized that. And this shift has uh, really come from the big guys like the Amazons and the Walmarts of the world. Um, and, and the shift really is that they have started looking at mountains and mountains of data and using that data, uh, you know, to optimize their supply chains, to uh, optimize their retail channels, to make things a lot more uh, smooth and running better. Um, and the way they've done that is they've just thrown money at it, right? So they basically said, uh, we've got all of this data, let's employ thousands of, uh, you know, data scientists um, to, to help us to optimize um, our, our supply chains. And the result is that, you know, they have become a lot more um, competitive in the market and they've left a lot of uh, other competitors um, you know, in uh, with a problem. So, um, how are they more competitive? Um, they are competitive by looking, or by by really by by training their consumers to expect that they will get everything exactly what they want, when they want it, and where they want it. 
And the consumer doesn't have to think too much about that. Um, Josh, just on the next slide. Um, and, and what's happening is that um, because everyone is now trained to, hey, I can just get whatever I want, whenever I need. And, and guess what? It's always the right thing at the right time. And there's never stock out and I can get them in the same day delivered to my door. Um, the problem is that, that consumers are now expecting this. So they've been trained to expect this. And if you want to compete um, you know, in the market, then these things are table stakes, right? If you, if you think you can still go into the old way um, of doing that, um, Josh, if we can just go to the next slide, um, you know, the, the, the old way are the, are, the, are the companies that think that they can say to the consumer, listen, this is our range. You will like this range. We will market this range of items to you. And um, because you are brand loyal to us, you will buy this. And that's changed. You know, it's wrong. People don't, don't operate like that anymore. People are now on the, on the page of, uh, listen, I don't care about your brand. I care about whoever is going to supply me with the right thing at the right time when I need it. Um, and not try and shove things into my space that I don't need. Um, and, and a lot of the older companies have, have really, really struggled um, to get to grips with that. I'm not saying older as in companies that are old. I mean, Amazon is pretty old in comparison with you know, the new companies these days, but companies with old um, type of thinking. Um, so you know, the, they just can't compete with, with these kinds of guys. But um, you know, what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing is that a lot of the companies that are um, you know, not Amazon and not Walmart, um, they can actually also compete in this, in this arena. Uh, why can they compete? Um, Josh, just next slide, please. Um, because we all have a lot of data um, from our ERP systems, from our accounting packages, and uh, our warehouse management systems, and so on. But um, we don't necessarily know how to take that data and convert it into you know, these best practices, like what Nicholas was saying. I was looking at some of the chats while Nicholas was talking and you know, even simple things like classifying your inventory into ABC, XYZ um, is, is daunting if you don't have you know, uh, systems to, to help you to do that. How do we do that? Um, and the problem is that you know, going um, and, and when your business starts growing, um, like Nicholas said, Excel becomes a liability where when you're a small business, it's, it's like your superpower, right? You have 500 items or you have 200 items and you've got this nice big Excel spreadsheet and it does everything for you. Suddenly you have 10,000 items and Excel can't do that for you anymore. So um, even though you do, you do sit on all of this data, it's very difficult to to make use of that in the way that Nicholas was, was explaining earlier. Um, so what do people do? Well, they, they write some reports or they get their uh, ERP provider to, or consultants to, to provide some reports. Um, and that, that works you know, well for a while. Um, problem with reports is they always look backwards. They never look forwards and understand what's gonna happen. They tell you, they tell you exactly what has happened and you like, oh, no, thank you, I know that. Um, but what, you know, what should I do today? Um, or the next thing they do is they, they get a BI product, right? So, okay, let's connect a nice BI product to our ERP system. And now you're sitting with the problem that Amazon had 15 years ago. I need you know, 10 data scientists to help me to make this BI tool do what I need to do. Um, so either you don't have access to those data scientists, they're very expensive uh, you know, uh, employees. Um, or, you know, the data scientists don't understand your business or don't have the knowledge of inventory best practices. So they can build what you, you know, might ask them, but they won't be doing these things in the way that is the, the best way to do. Um, so um, 
you know, like I said in, uh, on the next slide, this cannot be done in Excel once you get to a specific size, because if you get to that scale, um, you know, you need something to automatically look at, at things every day. Um, and, you know, Excel can, can get you so far, but, you know, doing the analysis, doing the forecasting for the next 12 months, and guess what? The next 12 months is not good enough anymore. People now have lead times of, you know, a, a year, nine months, a year, you know, a year and four months. How do you, how do you do that kind of forecasting in Excel? How do you get to your ABC, XYZ in Excel when you have 50,000 items? How do you understand what is your real lead time um, in an Excel spreadsheet? It becomes really, really difficult. So our um, mission has been for the, the last you know, 12 years to build systems with all of these best practices built in. Um, and those system, you know, our system will take, connect to your ERP, extract all of that information and automatically do all of these best practice stuff for you. Um, so that in the end, at the end of the day, like Nicholas said, you can be someone who just goes and works on the most critical things but there's a system in the background that will actually, um, you know, uh, do all of the, the grunt work for you. Um, so, uh, Josh, if we can go to the next slide, um, you know, our NetStock system has all of these dashboards built in. So, for example, like Nicholas said, you want to see where you've placed an order that's going to be too much. That you know, and, and, and which items are they and, we, and can we go and fix that? You wanna see where we potentially gonna stock out instead of, oh, we already have stocked out, now what, right? So if we can be proactive and if you can get something to alert you to say, um, please go and um, look at these items because you might have enough inventory on hand today, but you might be, be stocking out. You need a system that automatically classifies your, your, your inventory into the matrix every day, because guess what? You might be doing classification exercise um, and in uh, three weeks time, that's out of date because suddenly uh, items are now different, moving differently or they selling more or less and, and so on. And, and suddenly they're not the A item anymore. They're now maybe the B item. You need a system that can automatically do the grunt forecast work for you every day um, and um, you know, allow you to just go and pay attention to the items that the, the you know, computer forecast can't get that you know, right so well. You need a system that will automatically measure those risks that Nicholas was talking about. Can I forecast this item properly? If not, we need to put some safety stock in because we might be thinking that we you know, sell a certain amount in a month, but we're actually going to sell more. Uh, how reliable is my supplier? What, how, do you, how do you understand that? What, how do you understand when your supplier's lead time starts uh, taking off? You need to measure every single uh, item, every single delivery, every time it comes in and say, right, the, the supplier said it's going to be in 60 days. It took 75 days. Now it took 80 days. Now it took 100 days. And based on that risk profile, adjust how you do your ordering. Because if you're still going to order thinking that um, you know, the inventory is going to arrive in 60 days, you're going to run into a massive problem. So can we automate all of those things um, in a way? And that has been our mission. We also want to arm the, the smaller guys, the, you know, the guys that are not Amazon and are not Walmart with the tools to also compete in the market because that is important. And we realize that it's very difficult to do that if you're not at the scale of, of those big guys. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a, in a world where, you know, the only two companies that you can buy anything from uh, is uh, left are Amazon and, and, and Walmart. I want to have a, a vibrant community of smaller companies that are also producing, um, you know, goods for us and help us to, to, to have the right stuff at the right time. So that's our mission. We want to arm people with, with, with these tools so that you can also compete in the market. Thank you, Josh. 
All right, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Nicholas. We will now get to some q and I, I just have to say, I love the chatter back and forth. This has been a lively group. There's a lot of questions that have been asked. There's people want to start user groups. This is great stuff, uh, bringing people together. So I will do my best to go through questions that were in the chat. There is a Q&A um, section, which organizes it nicely for me. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in. Uh, Q&A is probably best, frankly, but uh, chat works too. And we will do our best to get back to you. If we don't get to it now, because we'll do about 10 minutes, um, we will do our best to, to get you an answer post-webinar uh, here. I, it, there's been a lot of questions too. We will send out the recorded version for everybody that registered for the webinar. webinar. Feel free to share that out with your, your team members who may or may not be here right now. Um, so with that, let me go back to my notes. And there was a lot of lead, early on in the presentation, we, we talked about uh, lead time. So uh, one of the questions was, was, if all products have a near or, or similar lead time, then would it be prudent to only use historical demand as uh, the drivers for an ABC XYZ um, categorization? And I'll, I'll, I'll give that to both Nicholas and Barry to, uh, to, to answer. Um. <clears throat> Actually, I, I, I would not advise to, to do that. So when you set up a dashboard, including ABC, XYZ, but not just ABC, XYZ, um, you want to highlight important product. Important product are things that are going to be important in the future with a high forecast, high value in the future. Not especially high forecast and high, high historical sales and high value in the past. Um, you can face seasonal, seasonality. For example, something's going to be a high runner in March, but maybe the season was really low in December, November, October. So on your ABC, if you do it based on historical demand, it will be rather low. Okay, you can have trend, you can have products, new product and product dying. So your top seller of 2021 will definitely be, will definitely not be your top seller of 2022. So uh, in short, I would not advise you to, uh, to use historical sales in ABC XYZ for sure. Absolutely agree. You always have to look to the future. Otherwise, you know, that's like looking in your rear view mirror and trying to go down the highway. Um, you, you're going to head for a crash. Great. Thanks. Uh, another one was how, how to automate this smart multi criteria analysis. Uh, do you build a sort of matrix? So I think that was going back to that was early on in the presentation talking. I think it was about the ABC XYZ um, side of it. So I'll, I'll give that one over to you. Yeah, sure. So I said it's very important to understand that in the supply chain, it's not just about uh, products that have a high forecast or high value, but you want to check all these products where you can collaborate with your supplier, products that have a short shelf life, and so on and so on. Obviously, all these criteria depends from one um, supply chain to the other. I might be talking to a new retailer. They basically cannot possibly discuss with their client. On the other hand, some of you have shelf life, some of you do not have such a thing. So it's really a a case by case discussion where you need to set up what are the criteria that make sense for me that would highlight product that I need to review first. Um, again, it might just depend on your collaboration with your supplier and your client. So it, it really depends on you. Um, another example is this um, business critical product. Maybe you have a product, it's kind of low value, you don't sell a lot, but it's critical for your business because if you run out of this, um, most of your client will stop buying other stuff. Uh, maybe it's a piece for maintenance, for example. Again, it's all discussion that we need to have one by one, business by business. Um, thank you. Uh, th there was a few comments, so I think they, these weren't exact questions, but I think that the, the the point is here. So people are struggling with lead times over the last you know twenty four months because of the huge standard deviation and just the the, the multiple variables that are are at stake, and that leads to untrustworthy data. So how do you look at doing something like this with volatility in the market uh, if you're looking forward and knowing that there's going to be volunteer, vol, uh, you know, but you don't, you don't know what it's going to be. So how, how do you address that? Maybe Barry, um, we'll start with you. No, go ahead, Nicholas. Yeah, it, this is a really important question and a very difficult one in the sense that there is no uh, black or white solution or magic secret that you would apply it and then it would work. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a difficult one. Um, it's also one of the things where you, as the human, in some cases, you can be much smarter than your mother. Your mother might say, well, in the past, the supplier took three months to deliver. 
But then on a specific day, your supplier calls, you're going to tell you, okay, we really face an issue here, whatever the issue is, it's going to be six months going forward. This is one of the cases where you as a human, you need to go in the tool and say, it's going to be six months instead of three months, for example. Um, now, again, you cannot expect human and you cannot expect model to foresee the future. I, I've been working years and years on machine learning and demand forecasting and data science and so on. We do not foresee the future. In February 2020, you could not have foreseen COVID and you cannot expect your team or your model to know that, right? So at some point, if you really want to be on the safe side, you need to think, okay, how do I edge these risks? Can I get two suppliers? Can I get another month of safety stock and so on? Yeah, I absolutely agree, Nicholas. Um, you know, there's uh, if we could predict, you know, predict the future that well, um, you know, we'd probably be writing software uh, to to buy stocks on the stock exchange, right, and and make a lot of money. So it is not possible. Um, but absolutely. So going back to your point, when your supplier, you know, communication with your supplier is always very, very important. So if your supplier says, "Listen, I've got a problem. It's not going to come through, or it's stuck on the ship, or it's in the in the ports, or something." go into your ERP and update the expected lead time or the expected arrival date, because that allows your inventory system to then uh, look at it and say, okay, now we know that that inventory is coming at a different date than we originally thought. Now there might be a time in between where we're going to be stocking out. Is there something we can do? Can we you know, move it from another uh, warehouse to this warehouse? Um, because they might have excess in that warehouse and we short, shorten this. Or is there another supplier we can we can use? Can we fly it in instead of ship it in? It's going to cost you more, but is it going to cost more than losing the sale? So there are a few things that you can do, um, but you know, we're all in the same boat, unfortunately, excuse the pun. Um, everyone around the world has got massive lead time problems. And you know, until these things start start um, improving, you know, we're all going to be suffering. What I can say is that the biggest, the biggest losers with this whole supply chain issue, issue are the companies that in the 80s we were so impressed with with their just-in-time um, uh, ordering. And, you know, there's a big, big difference between just-in-time and just too late. And the problem is if you don't have any safety stocks, then uh, a big shift like this in lead times can really, really affect your business. I mean, I've read articles of Ford Motor Company stopping production for six weeks because they couldn't get inventory uh, into the into the warehouse. Now, if the big guys like Ford is struggling with this, then you know the rest of us are definitely also struggling. So, yeah. Thanks, Barry. Uh, we'll we'll try to get to one more here, and like I said, we will we will do our best to reach out to everybody afterwards and and answer the additional questions, but. Um, so, uh, by I believe is his name asked, I would like to ask how I can integrate the demand forecast into the inventory replenishment. Uh, and he says, most people will use the historic demand, but if I use the demand forecast, my order quantity is equal to the forecast. So passing that over. Yeah, so, so what you need to do is, is uh, what Nicholas said earlier, so you have to look forward um, a, a, number of, you know, a number of days. So you have to look forward, um, first of all, your lead time, because where are we going to be? If I order today, what's my stock on hand going to be? Then you want to add your safety stock to that, and then your replenishment cycle. So how often do I want to uh, you know, reorder the stuff? And if you add those things together, you might come out at a 60-day or a 90-day, or you know, these days, a 360-day. Uh, and then you look at your forecast over that time period. Okay, so if I'm going to, in the next 60 days, sell uh, 500 units altogether, then, okay, where, are, where am I today? Where's the 500? What's the difference? And then order up to the, to the maximum there. So that's how you look forward using a forecast instead of looking backwards to what we used to sell in the past. Yeah, I think as a, as a general comment, uh, and, and I see this in, in the training courses I'm hosting with, with uh, uh, some companies, it's extremely important that we connect forecast and inventory planning. If you disconnect forecast and inventory planning, your maturity level is really, really low. And this is one of the first things you need to work on. So um, for these 200 people listening to us, if right now you're thinking in my supply chain, my inventory planner or supply planner do not use the forecast from the demand planning team, it really means that 
Um, let's see it on the bright side. You have room for improvement and bear with me. These are the next steps you need to, to, to do is basically to connect these two together. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Nicholas and Barry. Um, very informative. Uh, there's so much to dive in here. It's hard to get it packed into a, you know, a 45, 50 hour minute chunk, right? So um, again, we will continue the conversation um, after this. Uh, you can connect with the speakers there. You can connect with me as well. Uh, our LinkedIn uh, links are there. Um, and, and we can, again, continue the conversation, but thank you so much for joining our best practices for, for inventory in 2022. Um, we will continue to produce content like this throughout the year. So we, we, we hope that you, you guys continually join and, 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 uh, we, we'd love to get the feedback on how helpful this was for you. So thank you, everybody. Have a, a great rest of your day, wherever you are in the world. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Ciao.